Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Sharing Wisdom. I am super excited today, you all. I have somebody here that I feel like walks the same path that I do and that many of you also do as well. He um, has a crazy crazy success record in the real estate industry for one, but also for creating several businesses with less time working and more time living. So that is the language that I love to speak. And I literally just had a conversation with a client yesterday about this, how sometimes our mentality of like, you have to put in a lot of hours, you have to work a lot in order to get what you want. And I'm Mm -hmm. trying to help people rewire that. So today, Nolly Williams is here and he is going to help us understand that a little bit more talking about the three hour workday and how we can move our business in such a short amount of time. Welcome, Nolly. How are you? I'm super excited. I'm happy to be here, Angie. And I've been following you for a while, too. So I love your I love what you're doing for entrepreneurs and uh, it's very inspirational. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I we can't hesitate, but like we've got to jump into this whole thing on three hours because you hear a lot of people out there talking about working less and, Mm -hmm. you know, living more, but I don't know that people give you the precise way to do that. It sounds amazing, but you know, kind of clue us in on that. How exactly did you come up with this way of working these three hours and being able to drive such success to your businesses? Well, it's interesting because I've been an entrepreneur since the age of 12. Um, probably like many listeners, many of you listening right now, you know, you started in entrepreneurship or you were called to entrepreneurship maybe at 10 years old, 11, 12, uh, maybe at a young age. Maybe some of you are late bloomers. Maybe you got in at 18 or 19, you know, but I got in really early. And uh, because of my personality profile, I've always been I've always tested out as an engineer. Um, Mm -hmm. all the profile tests say that that's what I was supposed to be, (laughs) but that wasn't my, uh, sort of my preference. And Angie, when I was 12 years old, I was, uh, subscribing to small business opportunities magazine. And in that magazine, I didn't know it at the time, but I was just fascinated with it. And by the way, none of my friends subscribed. (laughs) So I'd kind of hide, hide the fact that I was a geek on this kind of stuff because it wasn't normal for my age, but I just thought it was so fascinating. There was all these different ways that you could make money. And uh, over time, what I've come to realize, you know, I've I've been an entrepreneur since age 12. I've had my own business since 23, where I've not had a W-2 for over 30 years. Um, And it's either you make it or or not, you know, and Mm -hmm. it's I've been super successful. But what I've what I've learned is that, you know, because at first I thought trading time for dollars was the way. And it can be a way, actually. It can it can actually work. Um, but it's an employee paradigm. It's an old uh, carryover from what we were termed as the working class, if you will. Mm-hmm. And for an entrepreneur, a business owner, actually, I learned that it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, the bigger my businesses became, uh, the less I had to work. And so um, I reverse engineered it in my new book to where anyone can 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 work three hours a day, or at the very least, make sure that they're spending three hours a day on the most income producing activities, which is only a couple of activities that actually make up what you do each day. Yeah. And and I love, I want to dig into that more because, and and let me ask you, when you first started these businesses and, and you've created several successful businesses, but did you always take that approach right from the beginning? Because I think most business owners find themselves the bigger they get, the more work they have, the more in the weeds they get and the more things they have to tend to, which actually ends up capping their business. So was this natural for you or were you in that situation at one point in time? I was, I was definitely in that, in that position for much of my entrepreneurial life. Mm. Um, and the thing is, as because of where I fall on the wealth dynamic scale, um, for those, I do a lot of personality profile testing, Um, And one of the systems I like is one by Roger Hamilton called Wealth Dynamics. And um, where I'm at on that, you know, I love the disc also, the disc profile. But where I'm at in that system, the the question that I'm always asking is, how can this be done without me? How can this be done without me? It's it's kind of a different question than I think a, a lot of entrepreneurs ask, but it's only because of the way I'm wired. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, many, many entrepreneurs and I, and myself included, I feel like we're wired to work, but what we've come to notice and the research has shown, and we're talking about Harvard studies. I've got so many different studies in the book and research, um, because you know, McGraw Hill, when they publish a book, you've got to have all the research and all the data, all the data points. And, uh, what we've come to learn is that what most entrepreneurs do during their day, there's only about 10% 10% of it that's moving the needle. In other words, mm-hmm. um, if you're looking this year, let's say you want to make a million dollars or 500,000, whatever your number is, there's going to be about 10% of the things that you do every day that move the needle 90%. And the other 90% of the things that you do move the needle 10%. So mm-hmm. what I'm teaching in with, with my seven step process in the blueprint is that you basically want to focus on the 10%, focus on the things that are really going to move the needle, and then you can delegate everything else to someone else. But yeah, just like most entrepreneurs, um, I, you know, I work 10, 12, 15 hours a day um, until I realize that there's actually an a easier way. I think that, I think one way to put it, and this is when I do my seminars, I kind of share it this way. You know, if I owned a McDonald's restaurant, I think they still call them restaurants, Angie. I'm not sure. But anyway, if I, if I owned a McDonald's, know, something like that. I don't know. <laughs> Is it really a restaurant? I don't know. Anyway, if I if, if I owned a McDonald's, OK, um, and I owned one location. All right. I'm new to the restaurant business, never done it before in my life. I'm probably going to be spending most of my time in that franchise. You know, I'm going to actually right. have a cot in the back room and I'm going to be mm-hmm. you know, that's my life. But if you fast forward about 12 years in the future, let's say I own now, let's say I own 15 locations. Okay. Well, in real, realistically, now I have 15 managers, one over every mm-hmm. location. And then I have a team of three people that manage the 15. And then I might have one COO or a couple CEO or a couple other people. Sure. I'm still the chairman and founder, but I've only, I'm only reporting to anywhere from one to three people. Right. And in reality, I'm doing a lot less now than I did when I owned one plat one one. Mm-hmm. And the reality is, all businesses the nat- the natural trajectory of any business goes from I to we to they. First, every every business starts off with I do it. I'm the one. Right. I you know I started my business. I do it all. Then it's we do it. I have a team, and other people are doing some things. I'm doing other things. And then if your business is on a natural trajectory, it em- eventually becomes they do it. Now you're a business mm-hmm. owner and you're living the true epitome of what a business is supposed to be. And that's mm-hmm. a business exists for the owner. It's it's to serve the needs of the owner. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why businesses exist. But at the end of the day, if it doesn't serve the needs of the owner, then it's out of balance. And so. Yeah. So, yeah, it took me a while to kind of understand this and reverse engineer it to where I could teach it to others. Um, but it's, it's really been fun because my thing is all about helping entrepreneurs cut a five, seven or 10 year learning curve off of what it's taken me or what it might Mm -hmm. take you uh, without having this information. Yeah. So, and I love that. And I think it's really interesting and I want to dig into that a little bit more because that learning curve, I think is a big piece from a mindset perspective. You know, when you talk about, you being like at the heart of the business in the beginning, the I piece, I think it's really hard for entrepreneurs to believe that they don't have to be the I anymore. You know, that right. I feel like, well, it's, it's my it's, business. It's my dream. It's my <laughs> vision. I have the ideas yeah. like without me, what is my company? And right. th- that's hard for people to think like nobody else could do it better. And I've got to be yeah. in it. Thoughts on that. Yeah, it's like me walking in. If I walk into a J.C. Penney and say, hey, I'm not going to buy a tie here unless J.C. personally attends to me. You know, I'm not going to yeah. buy anything. I, I, I want to see J.C. Well, that that's ridiculous. And it, at the end of the day, your business is, is actually doomed to stay small when you have that kind of mindset. Um, yeah. J.C. had to have the mindset uh, at some point that, you know, in order for me to actually scale my business, it has to be without me, you know, and mm-hmm, it, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter what works. It only matters what duplicates. That's one of my favorite quotes um, mm-hmm. that, that I've heard. Um, if it doesn't duplicate, it doesn't matter is another one. And the reality is mm-hmm. you can't really scale your business if you can continue to have to adopt 
an employee mindset because the reality is, Angie, that most entrepreneurs, what they've done is they've gotten out of the rat race. Kudos. That's really good. Right. But what they've done is they found themselves now on the hamster wheel. They've just mm-hmm. traded one hustle for another. <laughs> and while it is true, just like building a house, there's a lot of hustle and grind that goes into the first nine months or 12 months to build that custom home. But once that home is built, you should be able to live in it. And that hustle and grind should change to ease and flow. And that's the natural trajectory. So um, let me give you a quick story and then okay. um, that, that I think will cap it. So for me, I'm all about systems and processes. OK, and I'm all about what I teach in the book is, you know, first you hone your superpower. You have to understand who you are. Who did God create you to be? Mm-hmm. And you have to snap into that. A lot of uh, entrepreneurs believe, Angie, that they're here to do something. And you are, but you're not a human doing. You're a human being. So we're here first mm-hmm. and foremost to be. And it's understanding who am I as an individual? Um, once you understand who you are. That you can actually carry that into any industry, you know, like if I was in real estate, I could do it. If I was in selling plumbing parts, which I have a buddy of mine that ha- that's part of a plumbing parts company, which I used to make fun of plumbing, like ah, plumbing supplies, mm-hmm. but they do billions of dollars a year. <laughs> sure. uh, but I could actually take and you could take Angie, your skills to any industry and you would be who you are in that industry. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it goes all the way up to where you. You know, you you uh, start evaluating your business and then you delegate your business and then you create your team operations Bible, which is when you systematize your business. Well, I had mm-hmm. I in, when I was in the real estate space, um, I had done this. I'd created my team operations Bible. I'd hired a guy. He ran. He was running my team. And it was time for me to basically let him take the reins. But I was very afraid. I was very scared. And I uh, remember my wife wanted to go on this cruise. So we went and we, got, we were gone for 10 days. And as soon as we got on the cruise, they announced that if we were to make phone calls, uh, you know, or do anything on the Internet, it was a dollar a minute. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and I said, you know what? I'm not making any phone calls. I'm not going to do anything. And, and my cell phone went into the safe. Now, mm. you're listening right now. Ask yourself, when's the last time you put your cell phone and your laptop away for 10 days? Right. OK. Right. As an entrepreneur. And, and what I say, Angie, is if you can't do that, then your business needs a healing. OK. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so and most business owners can't do that. And I'm not knocking you if you can't. But I was in the place where I was like, can I really do this? I'm going to do it. So we went for 10 days. We had a great time. We had lots and lots of fun. But I knew I was going to I was going to get it because I did not tell my operations manager that I was going to oh, not geez. be in touch <laughs> at all. I didn't didn't uh-huh. mention that. So I knew that he was going to, his name is Hollis. I said, I knew Hollis was going to let me have it when I landed in, in, in Florida. And so the first thing I did when I got off that plane, Angie, <laughs> was shaking fingers and shaking hands. I called Hollis. I said, man, I'm really sorry. Uh, you know, I, I let you down. I, I didn't have my phone, you know, this and that, this is what happened. Yeah. But just give me what's hot. Help, you know, let uh-huh. give it to me hot and I'm on it. I'm ready to go back to work. And he said, Nolly, did you need anything? I said, yeah, I'm calling you from the man. You know, I'm in play. I'm, I'm on my layover and let me know what's hot, man. I'm back. I'm back in action. I'm, he said, Nolly, I'm real busy right now. But if you call me tomorrow, I might, you know, I could probably can help you. But I'm in the middle of something. Did, if you did, you need anything? And right <laughs> then, Angie, <laughs> I, I, I was both. You know, I hate to say it this way, but I was pissed off. I was upset. You know, right. I felt I felt like. What do you mean? Like, do like, dude, this is this is my business you're talking about. Right. And I was I not you needed. Say that. <laughs> this was a blow yeah. to my ego. It was a big right, blow. Right. But mm-hmm. so on one point, I was a little bit angry. And on the other side, I was like, wait a minute. Yeah, this 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 there. I'm on to something here. Um, and and I'm you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, because they hire the same profile as themselves. You know, now we've got two people not getting anything done. Right. And I always teach Angie, you hired the opposite of you. Uh, I've done that very well in my in my career. And uh, and it, it it's it's worked really well. But not only does it work for me, but it work it works for any business that wants to scale and that is ready to to scale. Yeah. And it's not an overnight journey, by the way. 
Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that story, I love the story. It's such a testament to what entrepreneurs put in their minds as far as the story of how needed they are and how they have to have yeah. their hands in the everyday, you know, nitty gritty in order to make it survive when it, it usually isn't true. But I've got a lot of questions for you. You know, you gave us a lot of detail there. First, I want to go back to that wealth assessment you were talking about or, or mm -hmm. the mindset. Tell me what that was sure. again and tell us a little bit about it, because I have a feeling a lot of people don't know what you're referring to. Yeah. So when it comes to honing your superpower, one of the things I mm -hmm. teach is that you have to understand who you are. And I used to watch when I was a kid, it was called the Justice League. OK, I'm dating mm -hmm. myself, but it was before the Avengers. <laughs> and you had Superman, Batman, you had Wonder Woman and you had several other uh, characters that would work together um, and fight crime. And they were really mm -hmm. good by themselves. But when they teamed up, they were unstoppable. And mm -hmm. now you've got the Avengers and so on. And so what I teach people is if you're the Incredible Hulk and I want to send you on a stealth mission, it's probably not going to go so well. You know, I want you to go in incognito and I want you to gra get the information and come out. All the Hulk knows how to do is smash stuff. OK, mm -hmm. so he's the wrong person for that mission. You've got to understand who you are. And it doesn't matter if you're the Hulk. That's OK. It's just that there's certain missions you probably shouldn't be going on. Mm -hmm. I'm going to probably send Adam man or that that one that can get real tiny, you know, Ant, the, Ant like man. be a fly on the wall. Ant man. Is that what it is? Ant man. Yeah, that's who I'm going to send. Not the Hulk. Maybe the invisible man. I think I'm oh, the invisible man around. Yeah, exactly. Oh, you, you you're speaking my language now. Yeah. If if I need something smashed, the Hulk is going to be at top of my list. Right. So w the way that you understand who you are, one of the primary ways um, is that you take different assessments. One of them is mm -hmm. the disc, the DISC, which is four personality yep. profile types. The other one is wealth dynamics, which is actually eight profile types. Mm -hmm. And I, I look at it as sort of like the disc on steroids. And there's a mm -hmm. bunch of others. There's like Clifton Strengths Finders and there's a bunch of other, sure. other ones. Um, and so once you understand who you are, and I recommend that you have your spouse do it as well. My wife mm -hmm. and I did it. I did it when I was 19 years old. And I married my wife when I just turned 22. She, uh, there was a guy that came to our church and did these assessments. And it was really good because I was able to see how she operates and able to, mm -hmm. even though she was the exact opposite of me, now I was able to appreciate her for her idiosyncrasies, <laughs> yes, <laughs> which yes. was what I thought, but it was just her expressing her who she is, you know? And so yeah. I say, Understand who you are, find out your personality profile, dig deep into it because it'll, it will shock you how accurate mm -hmm. it is if you're honest when you take the assessment. Yeah, um, I love it. And, I mean, and, have you taken yeah, the Enneagram? So, uh, I haven't taken that one. I've got several of my coaching students that are like itching to get me to take that one. So is that, is yeah, that good too? You really should, especially because it's, at, it's a great assessment. And I feel like it's one yeah. of the few that you can't really manipulate. Some of them, yep. I feel like you could really show up and be like, I want to be that dominant personality. And right. you answer the questions that way The Enneagram doesn't allow you to do that. And it's, it's actually, um, faith kind of oriented. Oh, so, I love it. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you that, definitely that's have to take that's that. what's up. OK, I'm doing yes. it. <laughs> I'm a big believer in it, though. And, and I have my clients, I have every one of my clients take it. And then when they're hiring, I'm like, if this is a top candidate, have them take it. You've got to Absolutely. know who you're dealing with. But you said something else I'm really curious about. You said um, get kind of the opposite of you or the person that might compliment yes. you. Which sure. I do believe in that. But in some instances, you hear entrepreneurs say, I need another one of me. The only time that you'll need somebody exactly like you is when you are desirous of uh, exiting the business. Like okay. you no longer want to do your role. You want to get out. You're, you're, mm -hmm. You know, then you probably need a carbon copy of yourself. And that's when you hire gotcha. exactly someone like you. But in most cases, if you're especially if you're solo right now, you're just by yourself or you have a small team, just a couple of people. Um, to fill in the gaps, you, you, especially for your main admin, which is going to be your first hire, um, mm -hmm. you want to hire the opposite of you, you know? So, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, there, there is going to come a time when you actually, um, w when maybe most of your hires are going to be exactly like you, you know? Mm -hmm. So it depends on where you are at in your, and what your goals are as well. 
where you're building. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. for the people, what you're saying makes so much sense, especially when you're talking about scaling your business and, and having multiple businesses or locations, like you give the example of McDonald's, JC Penney, but for the entrepreneurs out there who maybe don't have that vision of going, well, I'm not gonna have several locations or sure. franchises, this is just my business. Does this same philosophy and strategy apply? Yes, because I, I implore you, you know, what is your what is your ultimate potential? You know, my purpose mm -hmm. is to inspire you to become all that God created you to be so that you can live the life you were meant to live. The truth of the matter is, Angie, most entrepreneurs and most people are not living the life they were meant to live, um, mm -hmm. especially employees. I mean, when you when you the Gallup poll that did one hundred and fifty thousand uh, employees a different category altogether, but uh, found that 70% either hate or dislike their jobs. Mm. And it's interesting that many entrepreneurs don't really like what they do either. Um, they're just doing it as a means to whatever end they think. Sure. And when you look at um, the five regrets of the dying, there's a gal named Bronnie Ware. She wrote a mm -hmm. book. She it was actually an article, um, but she, she was a palliative care nurse that in Australia that only worked with like hospice type nurse um, mm -hmm. that only worked yeah. with people in their last 12 weeks of life. And she worked with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these people. And she mm -hmm. found that there was only five regrets that they had on their deathbed. The number one regret is I wish I'd had the courage to live a life that was true to myself, not the life others expected of me. That was the number mm -hmm. one regret, Angie. Mm -hmm. And when you take the the Enneagram uh, test, I don't even know if I'm saying that right, but yeah. when you take that test and you find out who you are and you start living according to how God designed you, you'll not have that regret, okay, on your deathbed. The second regret, um, can you even guess what the second regret was? The second top regret of those on their deathbed. Number one, I didn't, I don't, I didn't live the life of who God designed me to be. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. What, so, I so nobody, like to ask that question. What are you known for? Like at your funeral, right? Yeah. What are people going to say about you? And if it's that, oh my gosh, she was such a hard worker. She, she gave yeah. everything to her job. It's like, <laughs> who wants to go with that? Well, and the truth is none of them said, Hey, I wish I'd done an, another deal. I wish I'd closed another mm -hmm, sale. Mm -hmm. The reality is that you can do everything that you're doing in, even at a larger scale, and work a lot less than you're currently working, you know, and this is, it's, it's just a lie. And, a, and, a, and because when the, when the work, and this is a whole nother, uh, probably another topic or episode, yeah. but when, when the working class was invented as a concept, um, we took it and we ran with it, but in, 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 and, and we, many of us include myself because I'm first generation American, you know, my dad came here from Trinidad and mm -hmm. sought out a life and he loved this country and he, you know, uh, joined the military. He, uh, you know, he they paid for his college degree and he just said the best things about America possible. And he instilled within me that all anything is possible, you know, that you could really live the dream. Um, at the same time, many people have been brainwashed into believing that they can't accomplish all that God created them and sent them here for. And that's mm -hmm. just not true. And so for the business that says, hey, I'm comfortable being comfortable, um, the reason why most businesses don't want to reach their ultimate greatness, Angie, and most entrepreneurs and business owners is because they think that it's like, look, I'm already working 12 to 14 hours a day yeah. now. How could I possibly do more? And they think that doing more will equate more. And that's an employee paradigm. That's like mm -hmm. working overtime and getting you know double pay. That's not what we're right. talking about. We're talking about working less. And with those hours that you work, actually focusing on the things that will move the needle in your business. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And I think that starts with redefining like your value. In, yes. in the company where even yeah. employees, yeah. right? It's like, we've, like you said, been brainwashed, like put in this many hours, stay late, get in early. Sure. And that's how you're perceived to be of value. And right. really the majority of the time that people take at their desk is, is wasted. You know, we're Absolutely. just clocking time. Well, we're not, <laughs> they're just clocking time. That's what say, the study you know, show. Put in a long day. Absolutely. So, you know, 
I want to kind of question this and, and this just kind of came to my mind and, and maybe you can speak on it or not, but we can just have a conversation around it. Is that talking about like what you were made to be here and what God puts you on earth to do and, and share those gifts and passion. I think that a lot of people don't pursue that because they don't associate being able to make money doing it. There's a disconnect sure. between like, this is what I'm passionate about and these are my gifts, but here's yeah. what I can go do to make a paycheck. Sure. And and that's what keeps us, I think, from really one, working from a place of passion and living our best life. So when we yeah. start to merge those together, I think really it's understanding like when you work from a place of passion, your results sure. will show up for you and Absolutely. you will be super successful. But I, I'm curious your thoughts on that, why people get on that, you know, unhappy path of just a means to an end and making the paycheck versus pursuing uh, the, the passion. It's interesting how scripture says that, you know, when you're in the center of God's will, success will overtake you. What that mm -hmm. means is it will chase you down and tackle you like you can't mm -hmm. out. You can't not be successful when you're doing what you were designed to do. Um, yeah. It's a mis It's a misunderstanding because most people ask the wrong question. Um, it, you know, a lot of I hear people say this all the time. I can't afford that. That's the wrong question. Mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. or it's really a bad statement. It's an affirmation, actually, is what they're doing. They're, mm -hmm. they're making an affirmation. The, the better question would be, how can I afford that? And when you start asking different questions, you start understanding different paradigms. I remember when I was called to, uh, to in the seminar business and I was doing really well in real estate. Um, I started, you know, I was in the music business for 10 years. I started that business uh, with $1,800 that I'd uh, just gotten from friends and family. Didn't even have a startup mm -hmm. capital. And within five years, I was making over $150,000 a month. And I was in my 20s. I was 29, made my first million dollars, got into real estate, sold over a, a thousand homes my first 10 years, made millions and millions and millions of dollars doing that. And when... I, you know, I had just sold 153 houses in Austin, Texas. I was the number one ranked by Austin Business Journal real estate agent in the city out of 9,800 agents. And I was going to grow from 150 deals a year to 400. Mm -hmm. And I got called into teaching. And I was like, no, I'm not going to. That's dumb. I'll teach on the side, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to be a full time teacher. And I got the voice says, no, this is what you're going to do. If you start next year, I was like, nope, I ain't going to do that. <laughs> and, uh, but I've, I'm, I've always been in tune, um, you know, and so with, with the Lord. And so I was like, it, I wrestled with it and I just couldn't sleep. I couldn't get any peace. And I said, okay, I'll do it. But there is absolutely zero way I can monetize this. I mean, mm -hmm. I was making a lot of money in real estate sure. and I could, and I like making money by the way. Mm -hmm. You know, I tried broke. <laughs> I didn't like it. All right. <laughs> and I've, I've been through bank bankruptcy. I've been through foreclosure. I've been through all that mm -hmm. um, in my, mm -hmm. in my life. And so, you know, I've had very hard times. I was, a, I was an abused kid. I was physically abused, mm -hmm. mentally and emotionally abused, abused as, as a child. And uh, so I was like, I, I don't, I don't want to get into the teaching business because I can't see the money in it. Mm -hmm. And, I just wouldn't do it. But that was naturally where I was being called. And so finally, it's 2014. I said, you know what? And I was upset. I said, I'll do it. But I'm probably going, you know, I'm thinking the worst. Right. But I said, no, I'm going to yeah. go on faith because I know where God guides. He provides. I'm going to I'm going to believe. But I can't see a way to make money doing this. I just can't see it. And so um, I, I started it and it was, you know, it was uh, my first gig. I got to speak 150 people. They didn't want to pay me anything. I told my wife, I'm not going to do it. They're not paying. And, and she said, well, what happened? She, I said, I, they, they're not going to pay me anything. She said, you call them back right now and tell them you'll take that. And I said, no, I'm not, they're not paying me. She said, you're going to speak. So I started speaking for free. Now I'm doing it for uh -huh. free. And I'm like, what is going on here? So right. two months into this, Angie, I went to a conference and I was trying to market a product. Nobody wanted it. OK. Uh -huh. And finally, I was talking and everybody kept saying, well, what's this book you have? I said, well, I wrote a book and it teaches homeowners how to do this and that. And it helped me do. And they said, well, how do I get that book? Everybody, mm -hmm. that's all they wanted, Angie. Mm -hmm. 
And I said, well, wait a minute, maybe that's something I could license. So I started licensing right. it. And lo and behold, within a few months, I was making about $70,000 a month in the seminar mm. business with a mm. great product. And I was providing way more value than I was getting, you know what I'm saying? Mm. Um, and I, I did not see a way to make money in that business, but I was obedient to the calling that that's where I was supposed to be. And um, a lot of people don't know how to monetize. I mean, you, you, do, uh, you, you do great coaching, uh, Angie, with people on how to monetize their passion. And the reality is every passion can be monetized. It doesn't matter even if you, it doesn't matter what you do and what you're good at. Um, it can be monetized if that's where you're supposed to be. So you got to understand where you're supposed to be, get in that space and you will get paid for doing what mm -hmm. you, you know, you'll, you'll be rewarded. I should say it that way. Yes. I love that story. And mm -hmm. it's, it's really true in the sense of like, but I think you have to not start with what you're going to get paid and how much that can't be your, I don't, you can't be the, that can't be, the it. Beginning. it can't be it. It can't be it. You can't, and your it. story shows that like you have to focus on what you're being called to do. You have to focus on that passion piece yeah. where your gifts are, and then it will be shown to you in some way, shape or form of like, okay, this is how you're going to make money doing this. It's almost as if like you yeah. had to kind of prove to yourself and, it, and, and prove to him that your obedience yeah. before he revealed like your full path to you. So there's a scripture that says uh, you will hear a voice saying to you wh whenever you turn to the right or to the left, you'll hear a voice saying mm -hmm. to you, this is the way walk you in it. OK, mm -hmm. but the voice doesn't come until you turn to the right or left. So you don't get the voice. OK, it's like the, the, man, the you know, the woman on the shore that says, OK, I'll get in my boat and once I I'll get in the sailboat and I'll sail. But I got to know where I'm going first. And I right, suffer with this right. because I'm. I like to know all everything, all the details before I launch. I, I want, yeah. and we call that FTL, right? Failure to launch because you got to have everything mm -hmm. perfect before you launch. Um, and it's like, no, that's not quite how it operates. Um, whether you talk, you know, some people call it quantum dynamics, quantum field. That's just where God lives. But the reality is once you get your boat off the shore and into the water, then you'll get the instructions. So sure. it doesn't work the other way around. No. And a lot of people just don't understand that. Well, it's that craving for security and stability. You know, it's the, and sometimes I think a lack of faith and mm -hmm. trust in whether it be God or whether it be in yourself and right. all part of the pieces that, you know, what I deem and what I refer to as the non-negotiable you, you know, in the book sure. that I recently wrote, because you have to have all those pieces in order to make that leap, in order to just get your boat off the shore. And, and I right. think most people suffer from this, like, I've got to have that perfect plan. I have to know that this is 100% going to work out. And I mean, how many things in, in life are 100% guaranteed? It's so foolish because if you were to calculate, like, for example, if I was to calculate and you just do this on any important business decision that you've ever made, mm -hmm. you'll notice that there's this unseen hand that's been guiding you every step if you care to watch and listen. And it is impossible. All the variables that have to happen in order for you to Let's say, for example, how did I meet my wife? Well, there's no way I could have orchestrated that. You know, mm -hmm. first of all, you know, I had to move from Los Angeles to Texas. She had to move from South Texas to Austin. You know, we mm -hmm. and then we met. We started going to the same church. Then she had to try to hook me up with her niece because my wife is nine years older than me and her oh. niece is my age. So I was uh -huh. 18. Her niece, was, I was like, uh, I think I was 19, 20. Her niece was 19 or 20. And mm -hmm. so she was connected. Oh, he is a nice guy in church. And then in the process of that niece didn't like me. I didn't like her. And, but I, but her aunt was nice. So we started hanging out. We weren't uh, romantic or anything, but uh, we just became friends. Like, and I was trying to help her find somebody her age. She was trying to help me find somebody my age. And then we were like, wait a minute. <laughs> so that, <laughs> Trust me, yeah. I could not have planned that. And anything that you've ever done that's big like that, there's so much what we call sort of, um, you know, quantum. Some people call it quantum entanglement, but there's so many different things that there, there might be a million things that have to happen in order right. for that. Absolutely. Uh, you know, from the beginning of the universe, all this stuff has been. Here's a quote I want to read. And because I think it I love it. OK. okay. And, and it's and I'm being asked to read this right now. So it's Gary Halbert. He says, properly exploited, 
One good idea that occurs while walking on the beach could be worth more than 10 lifetimes of hard work. Hmm. And when you think about that, Angie, and, and most entrepreneurs don't take enough time off. And when they're on vacation, mm -hmm. they're thinking about work. <laughs> mm -hmm. They'd rather be working mm -hmm. because it's a dopamine fix that they're getting that they sure. don't realize that that's what it workaholism. But um, you could be when I started taking time off, I started now tapping into this knowledge and mm -hmm. I started getting ideas that were not coming from within me. Right. And I've created things that I could have never created being stuck in the weeds and stuck in the mm -hmm. hustling grind, you know, and the minutia. And so when you start, you, does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, so for sure. The, I mean, I, I preach it all the time to my clients. You have to have <laughs> that stillness. You have to have that space. You have to. Yeah. And it, without it, you know, you don't even have the capacity to let things come That's into right. your mind right. to be that's that right. creator um, for your business. Yeah. And, and I think that's where we align a lot on, you know, is this live more kind of philosophy. I'm very sure. much of the belief that if we don't proactively take responsibility to put the things that are important to us in our life, we yeah. will never ever tap into our full potential. We'll never That's right. be on that path to using our gifts and contributing what we really could, which is in the end where we get that joy and that fulfillment. That's and right. So many people believe that we've got to, you know, put everything else first besides ourselves and besides the things that are important to us. And it's so counterproductive. It's counterproductive. You know, there's 14 life areas. I call it the life abundance wheel. And mm -hmm. as entrepreneurs, and me myself, I learned to only focus on one area. I mean, obviously spirituality was big for me, but mm -hmm. a career in business is another area. Um, and there's so many other areas. And because most entrepreneurs have never learned how to live in all the areas of life, mm -hmm. uh, they're, they, you know, they've been developed mostly in the business. They believe that that's all there is. And that's the only way that they can get that rush or that adrenaline fix. Um, and, but the reality is there, there, there's so much more. Let, let me say this real quick too, Angie, because I don't want everybody to get the wrong idea with three hours a day. It's about spending three hours a day on the right things in your business. So if someone comes to me and they say, Hey, I want to work nine hours a day. I'm fine with that, but I want you to spend three hours a day on only income producing activities, which only there's only a couple. Um, and then whatever you do with the rest of your time, that's up to you because you're only going to move the needle 10% with all the other stuff you do. That's fine right. if that's what you want to do. But eventually I think what you'll find is that when you're spending this three hours a day, okay, on the, on the two big picture priorities, I call it, um, you'll find like, Hmm, you know, do I really want to do all this other stuff? That's really not moving the needle. And a, Little by little, you'll want to do it less and less. The stuff that mm -hmm. really doesn't matter. Um, a business only will ever have two problems ever. And that's a, that's good news. You either don't have enough money or you don't have enough time. Okay. Mm. And the money problem is, you know, it's like you don't have enough leads coming in your business and you basically generate leads and close sales. That's how you generate money. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's how you fix that problem. Once that problem is fixed, it's like a restaurant. Maybe they don't have enough customers and they're trying to, screw, but then pretty soon they get on, maybe they get on HGTV or maybe they're on the food network. Okay. You know, Oprah tried one of their cookies. I don't know. Something happened. Mm -hmm. And now the line's out the door. They've got us, they've got a two, like we went to a restaurant last month. It, it, it was like two weeks uh, for, to get, you know, reservation. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm here today. I do stuff spontaneous. They're like, you ain't getting in today, buddy. I'm like, well, I'm not coming back in two weeks. They're not, like, Sorry, not even see you, you? They, come on, Nolly. Really? Yeah, exactly. And so I was like, do you know who I am? <laughs> and so, so the, so, so it's interesting because now they have the other problem. Okay. Now they have a, t a time problem. Now it's, we're so good that we, we don't have like, um, I'll give you an example. There's, there's a gal, um, that I coached and she was, doing so much production. She was number one in her office out of mm -hmm. 400 in, in the real estate space, 400 agents, but she was working 14 hours a day. Mm -hmm. um, and she was really good. And she was, you know, but the reality is when she looked at it, there was only a couple of things that she did every day that really moved the needle, you know, generate, generate leads and go on mm -hmm. appointments, close sales. Um, right. But once you, again, once you have a time problem, 
you, and you've got people that can basically your leads are coming in. You got more money than, you know, you're good there. Now you move it into your big problems are going to be, or your big, two big picture priorities are going to be leadership and branding. Mm -hmm. That's how you're going to spend your three hours on those mm -hmm. two things. 90 minutes of leadership, 90 minutes of branding. Branding is like, you know, your podcast, your YouTube channel, your social media, all the stuff that you do in that area that you haven't hired people to do that you have mm -hmm. your TV show, things like that. Uh, and then leadership is going to be leading your team. You know, all the people that are doing all the stuff that you once did, you've got to mm -hmm. provide daily and weekly leadership to them so they know what to do and how to do it and doing the right things in the right order. So it, it's actually very simple to solve the problems of business, but you've got to do them in the right. You've got to do the right things in the right order. Right. Absolutely. So I, I yeah. love that breaking it down in these two pieces in the initial phase, two pieces in the next phase. And I yeah, want to make sure it. I could sit here and talk to you all day about all <laughs> the things, life and faith and all this. But I do want to make sure that we kind of give our listeners here um, some clear direction and sure. give them some takeaways here in the sense of like, yeah. if we go back to what we started this conversation on about the three hours yeah. and, and I love that you kind of went back and said, it's not about, you can only work that much, but moving the needle on those things. How does sure. one start to figure out, you know, like how to get rid of the rest of it? Yeah. And so I would say, um, basically, or, or you mean how to, how to scrape it off your plate? Let me show you, yeah. let me, yeah. Let me tell you how I did it. I'm, I'm okay. And I'll be as brief as possible. I love stories sure. because they kind of help me make sense of, of the world. So yeah, I was about eight share. months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was eight months into a new career and I was do, I was knocking it out of the park. I was doing so well in the, in the real estate space. Um, and, but I was overwhelmed. I was working all the time. I didn't have, it was like, I was so overwhelmed. And mm -hmm. when you're really good at what you do, everybody, wants you. And they're like, Hey, we want to do business with you. But you're like, well, wait a minute. There's only so many hours in a day. So what yeah. I did, Angie, is I took out a yellow notepad and I wrote down every single thing that I did. I didn't know of any other way to do this. So mm -hmm. I did it this way. There's a simpler way to do it um, too, but I'll show you in a minute. But so I wrote down every single thing that I did on a listing, you know, and it was, turned out to be 46 different things. And then I rated those things from a scale of one to five. One means I hate mm -hmm. doing it which I don't really mm -hmm. use that word in my vocabulary, but that's how I felt about it. And then right. five is I love it. Okay. So it's, I hate it is a one, a two is I don't like it. A three is I like it. A four is I really like it. And a five is I love it. And mm -hmm. so I rated all these different things that I did every day. And Angie, what I said was I'm only ever going to do fours and fives. And I've got to figure if I don't really like it or love it, I'm not going to do it. And that was the mm -hmm. philosophy eight months into my new career that I adopted. Mm. And I had to figure out how to do that. And the easy way to do it is the if you're going to delegate what you hate, OK, the things you don't like doing, you've got to hire the opposite of you, because if sure. you hire the same as you, the person you delegate to is going to hate their job too, <laughs> just as much <laughs> as you did. But you hire the opposite of you. They're going to love filing and paperwork mm -hmm. and systems and all the other stuff that maybe you don't love doing. OK. And so it's as simple as really that. And I teach it in the book. You know, you write out all the things that you do, rate them on a scale of one to five. And then it doesn't have to happen overnight. But purpose, like if I like doing something, Angie, I won't do it. I've got to really like it or love it or it doesn't follow mm -hmm. my plate, period. Mm -hmm. OK. And I won't compromise on that. Now, initially, I might do it all, but I know that that's a season. OK, if I'm starting a new business or I'm writing sure. a book like the book I just finished, then, yeah, I'm going to have a season of where I work maybe five or six hours a day while I'm working mm -hmm. on that project. But once that project is done, I'm back to my three hours a day and I'm filling that only with the things that I like or love, because truthfully, you know, and, and this is interesting, Angie, that most entrepreneurs will work 20, 30, 40 years without knowing that there's actually a better way. There's an mm -hmm. easier way to earn all the money that you desire and not have to work as much as you're working. Why do you think that is? Um, I think there's two reasons. One, I think is because we love working. I mean, we mm -hmm. really like it. Scientifically, when you look at, and all these studies are in the book as well, but when you look at um, 
what we get out of uh, being workaholics. It's 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 <laughs> it's funny. It's it's like the one that we treasure. It's like, oh, yeah, you, we can high five yes. each other. I'm a workaholic, too. Um, but the reality is the toll that it, there's a blowback, the toll that it's really doing on our health, our stress mm-hmm. levels, our uh, quality of life. Everything is so it's so bad, even if. Even uh, there's been, you know, a lot of lots of cases of people that are doing the Lord's work, but they're working too much and Mm -hmm. they're still killing themselves. And so there's really no excuse for for it. But I think it's number one ego. It makes me feel good to know that, like I can say, look, I put in 15 hours. I mean, I put in 16. I mean, there's that. Right. And Mm -hmm. it's, it's it really is ignorance. Because when you think about it, Angie, when we were created in the Garden of Eden, we had no job. There was no there was nothing for us to do. It, it, I mean, we tended the garden, but it was like, hey, you know, you could relax. You, everything was good. We had everything provided for us. OK. Mm-hmm. And when you really look at it, work came as a result of a curse. OK. The earth was cursed by the sweat of your brow. You should not eat bread. And we we now embrace it like it's a great thing, like it's Oh, it's yeah. great that I'm working 16 hours. Well, that's just, that's, that's idiotic. Um, mm-hmm. So it's because they don't know a better way. And if they find a better way, it's ego. A lot of times won't allow me to go with a better way because then I got to like, I mean, it's embarrassing to say I work with three hours a day, man. Are you lazy? What's going on? You know, what? What's, you know, that's it. You know what I'm saying? It, 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 so there, there are some myths around three hours a day and I break them in, yeah. down in the book. And there's a lot of common questions around it. But in reality, it it's it is. I mean, I have time freedom. I have the three, the holy grail of freedom, which is what mm-hmm. all entrepreneurs want. And if you want this, then you've got to create a, a business for yourself that serves you, not the other way around. You know, mm-hmm. most people don't own a business. Angie, they own a job, you know, right, right. and the, the holy grail of freedom is time freedom. I work when I want to work location freedom. I work wherever I want to work. Mm-hmm. And uh, financial freedom. You know, I have far more income than what I spend. And so it it really is the it, it is what most entrepreneurs want. But again, the ego a lot of times um, won't allow me to 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 have it. Sure. Yeah, you know, the ego and fear. You know, if you think people fear fear is a big one. Being able to guilt. succeed at it, um, Shame. guilt, absolutely <laughs> lack of being in the present moment. Really, they're either going to the past yeah. and having that guilt, regret, remorse, or they're going to the future and worrying and fearing and having that anxiety. So, so much of it, sure. I think, you have to be anchored in the present moment to be able to do that. Um, in order to have those, you yeah. know, the holy grail of freedoms there. So. It, it's fascinating to me too. There's this shift, you know, as what we're kind of evolving. It used to be like work, work, work. Yeah. And it started, you started to get trophies for working the most for almost being burnt out. And sure. I, I pulled an all nighter and I did all this. And there's a lot of leaders and coaches who kind of preach that. And then sure. there's the new way of going, Hey, you know, you can work three hours in a day. You can work only four days a week. And I think people get stuck going like, well, what side am I on? You know, what's the cooler side or what people are going to think of me? And that even, especially in a company, it's really hard to make a decision on your own around that if you feel like your competition is in one side, right? And it's It's, it's it's interesting because, yeah, it's it's fascinating. But the reality is... um, Whichever way you decide, like you say, hey, I want to work eight hours a day. That's how I want to work. I want to be like, which is basically a a concept from the Industrial Revolution. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, that after Henry Ford kind of came up with this sort of this eight hour day, um, then it was standardized and all that. But the reality is it's an old construct. And if you look at what's happened in the last 100 years, Everything has evolved, like the medical industry has evolved more in the last hundred years than all of recorded history. Same mm-hmm. thing with, you know, technology, same thing with, you know, health, the health medicine field, um, food, all, all, all fields of event. Well, food, maybe not so much. I mean, but our information's there, but eh, <laughs> how, how we're implementing may not be there. But the reality is we have so much knowledge, but the but the archaic eight hour workday is still in play. And I get mm-hmm. it. I get it that there has to be workers. There have to be people. But for the owner, there's a possibility of, of, of a different way of living. And so what I tell people is 
at, at least you, you're doing it by design. If you want to work, you can work as like uh, Warren Buffett doesn't have to, but he likes, he loves working. Like that's what he wants mm-hmm. to do. He wants to work all the time. Well, if you do it by design instead of default, that's okay. Okay. But if you're living by default because you're in fear, what's going to happen when I'm not at, you know, if I'm not grinding, I got to grind all the time because if I, you know, take time off, it's going to fall apart or whatever. And maybe mm-hmm. your business isn't set up enough to where you can step back. And that's what mm-hmm. I basically help people do in the book. It, it chronicles how to set everything up to where you can actually enjoy this. But I, but I want to give people choices. So like you said, if you, you can choose either way, but mm-hmm. don't have the choice made for you. Most people, Angie, are making their choices out of lack. Yeah. Out of lack. Scarcity, you know, they yeah. don't have enough. So they're, they're having to do this. And I want you to make it as a choice that look, if I want to, like me, if I want to take, you know, the next six months, if I want to take the next year off, it will not mm-hmm. affect my lifestyle at all because I have that residual income coming in that it, it you know, it, 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 I'm good, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I want more people to have that choice. It's yeah. a shift, you know, from scarcity to abundance for sure. Absolutely. And, there you go. You said yeah, it. And it all goes back to, to like who you are. You know, everything comes from you. And if you do not have that in place, your authenticity, your self-trust, your responsibility, then none of that is possible. And it's it's why I always advocate to, you know, start with yourself, work on those pieces, and then you you will be the person who can make that decision, who can work through that decision, who can lead yourself. But without it, you know, you're at the mercy of, of your circumstances, of your environment, of everything that's going on around you. So... Yes. Gosh, not like yeah, I, I mean, would literally sit here and chat with you. All yeah. Time. Yeah. I know. I know we're at time already, we're have have but, but, it, but yeah. yeah, but what, based on what you said, I mean, it's so interesting that most people don't do the work of mm-hmm. finding out exactly who they are. And I started doing this work at 19 and because I started doing the work th- more than 30 years ago, um, I've come to be desensitized to how hard it is because people mm-hmm. tell me, man, this is really hard work. But I've been doing this work for over 30 years. Like, who am I really? Like, at the deepest level, who am I? Um, Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I tell you, it's it's interesting that you can start coaching someone that's been an entrepreneur for 20, 30 years and successful that's never done that work. And their their life is unfulfilled. They're making millions, but they're miserable. Right. I see it all the Mm -hmm. time. All the time. Yeah. And, and and to get them to see that, like, gosh, if you start to shift and you start to understand who you are, what fills you up, you start with yourself, you're going to be 10 times more successful, first of all, Absolutely. and have your fulfillment with it. But it's a hard thing for the mind to grasp. You know, we've been wired, some would even say, you know, genetically and then environmentally and culturally, all of that that comes into play. And you have to be a student of your mind and yourself every single day in order to absolutely. That. You don't. Yeah, we've been programmed unless you are with yourself. We've been programmed absolutely. Yeah, and you're people right. People want to shortcut that all the time. They want to just go, you know, give me that quick fix. Tell me how to do it. And it's like, well, start with yourself first. Get yourself to be the person <laughs> who will able to implement all of those fixes, right? That's right. So that's right. We're gonna have to have right. like a, you know episode two of Nolly Williams on, <laughs> on the podcast soon, because you have so much wisdom to share. And, and speaking of that, I do always like to wrap up and, and have you share, and you already gave us some really great quotes and scriptures, but what is the best piece of wisdom that anybody has ever shared with you that you hold on to this day and always bring forward? Wow. Um, the best piece of wisdom, um, mm-hmm. You know, the, uh, it really goes back to, uh, I'll just say it this way because it's the first thing that pops in my head. Yeah. It goes back to John fifteen five. You know, if a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Mm-hmm. And it taught me when I read that scripture um, at 18 years old, it taught me that I can't do this by myself. Nobody succeeds alone. You know, I've got to have help. And I, and I laid hold of that help. Right. And so we can't, what we're, what we, what you are accomplishing to do in your business 
cannot be done by you and you alone. It just is not possible. You got to think like an old Western town. They had a lot of players. You know, you had mm -hmm. a blacksmith. You had somebody that owned the store. You had a doctor. You had to have, you know, a couple of farms. You had mm -hmm. a, you know, the general store. You had it all worked, right? Yeah, you had a saloon. I get that. Yeah. But you, but they all worked. And, and in your life, you're going to need different players in order to for it. You can't succeed by it. Nobody succeeds alone. Yeah. Nobody succeeds so alone. So true. Mm -hmm. So true. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's been amazing. Thank you for sharing everything. Um, I wish we could have dug in a little bit more specifically, but we're going to send people to your book, um, your three hours a day, how entrepreneurs can multiply their income by working less and living more. Um, it's a must read. So you all get out there and get it. Um, anything else you want to throw in there, Nolly, as we wrap up? People well, I want to appreciate you. and, yeah. you know, I, I want to acknowledge the work that you're doing, Angie. It's, it's very refreshing. Mm -hmm. You know, you're very true to your identity. You're living the lifestyle that, that I speak about, you know, yeah. um, you're able to up and leave and go where you want and, you know, live a, f a very fresh and free life. And so you're, you are an inspiration. And so I, I thank you for, for your authenticity and being who you are and showing up that way. Um, and yeah, if anybody wants to reach out to me, if you can spell my name, which is not easy, K N O L L Y <laughs> dot com. That's where all things Nolly live, Nolly dot com. Um, and yes, thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate you, Angie. Thanks, Nolly. And thanks for that acknowledgement. I think there's no other way to do it than to live what you preach and um, show by example. So thank you so much.